We've talked about needs and requirements and how we use business and the requirements analysis to translate between them. Let's now look at requirements in a little bit more detail, and we need to start with the definition. A requirement is the result of that formal transformation of one or more needs into an agreed to obligation for an entity to perform some function or possess some quality. And of course, that's always within some specified constraints. Because we're talking about performing some function or possessing some quality, it's quite common to refer to two major categories of requirement. The first is a functional requirement, something the system should do or provide. The remaining types of requirements are often called non-functional requirements. That is, they refer to some property or some quality that the system must possess, or a condition it must meet, or a constraint under which it must operate or be developed. Requirement statements shouldn't be written in isolation. But as we write each sentence, we should support it with performance statements, verification statements and rationale statements supporting each of those statements. We need to also include definitions of other systems with which the system must integrate and to which it must interface. We also should include any information about the application domain, the context within which the system is going to operate. Requirement statements have the same structure and follow the same rules regardless of the level at which they're written. It should be noted, however, that the requirements in the BRS and the STRS are probably much higher level and therefore not quite as formal as those in the SYRS. Now, as well as the broad categories of functional and non-functional, there are lots of other adjectives used to describe the nature of a requirement. So you'll often hear reference to things like operational requirements, stakeholder requirements, environmental requirements, interface requirements, system requirements, regulatory requirements, safety requirements, design requirements, and many, many more categories. Largely, though, these are simply ways in which we might group them so we can make some sensible use of them. In general, it's true, particularly at the system level, that a requirement should be a statement of what, not how. That is, you should say what the system should do rather than how it should do it and force any particular design on a lower level designer. However, this is often too simplistic in practice because it may well be essential the system does a particular thing in a particular way, to be interoperable, for example, uh, with another system or to meet some particular standard. Also, a, a, a particular statement is much less easily confused than an abstract statement, so if it's what the upper level designers want, they should say so and remove any ambiguity. That's also true because the specifiers of the system are often the domain experts. They're therefore probably best placed to state how the system should be developed and how it should operate, rather than leave it to junior designers. So we've talked about needs and requirements. Well, why do we really need them? Well, it should be obvious by now, but there are a number of very important reasons. First, we need them to be able to define the scope of the project. If we don't have them, how else will we know what the system was to do? Then, we need to ensure that everyone involved has had their input and all the various points of view have been reconciled. The only way to do that is to group all the requirements into a balanced set of requirements. We also need to be able to justify any expenditure of funds or any effort by the organisation in meeting the need in terms of being able to meet that endorsed set of requirements. And then, of course, when we're doing the work, we need to be able to report on progress. How do we know how far we are through the project? We need to report back against the set of requirements. And then finally, of course, we won't know whether we're finished until we can tick off each of the requirements. So all in all, we need requirements to be able to describe the project, but also to help us manage the project. While we're talking about definitions, let's look at some other major definitions, some of which we've seen before in earlier modules. A user is someone who's involved in using the system once it's been developed. Strictly speaking, users are part of the system. They're there as part of the other elements of a system, such as materials, facilities, data, software, hardware, and so on. And because they're part of the system, users are sometimes called actors. That is, they play a role as part of developing the functionality of the system. So users will include operators, maintainers, and so on. Now, users work for the customer. The customer is the organisation that's paying for the system to be developed. Within the customer, there is an acquirer, who is the entity that's acquiring the system. Because the users are normally too busy with their operational tasks, they don't have the time, or necessarily the expertise, to acquire new systems. Large customer organisations will therefore most likely have a separate acquisition organisation, that is, separate from the user organisation. And as we said before, the customer is probably not big enough these days to be able to develop the system themselves, so they'll engage with the developer. Now that developer is the person responsible for developing the products that make up the system. That developer could be in-house, 
But most likely these days, the developer is part of a contractor organisation. And the contractor is the organisation within which the development is conducted, and as we said before, normally therefore under contract with the customer to do the development. We also mentioned a stakeholder, and a stakeholder is anyone that's got the right to influence the requirements, sometimes more generically called anyone that's affected by the system. Users are invariably stakeholders, but other stakeholders may include management, clients, the public, and so on. Well, we've talked about needs and requirements and the various levels at which they exist. In passing, we made reference to requirements analysis, which is really part of a bigger picture called requirements engineering. As illustrated here, requirements engineering is the formal process through which we move from enterprise strategies down to the system requirements. First, by formally translating the business needs into business requirements, into stakeholder needs and requirements, and then into system requirements. We also saw earlier why we need requirements. Well, why do we need requirements engineering? Well, obviously, if we need to be able to move knowingly between requirement sets, we need a formal process to be able to do that. We need to be able to guarantee that we have a complete set of requirements that's unambiguous, that's complete, that's non-conflicting, and so on. We need to be able to trade off functionality for cost, which implies that we understand all of the things we're required to do, plus their priorities, plus their costs, and so on. And then finally, things will change. So through requirements engineering, we need to be able to manage the changes in requirement for a wide variety of reasons. In this module, we've discussed requirements, the levels at which they exist, and the relation between them at each of those levels. We looked at a number of definitions, and then finished with an introduction to requirements engineering. In the next module, we'll look at much more detail at requirements engineering and how to create and validate a set of requirements.